Okay, so thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lin Feng Zhang, who is Vice Dean at the AI for Science Institute in Beijing. And he's also founder of the company DP Technologies. Um, his background's in applied mathematics and um, and he was undergraduate, his first other, earlier degrees in physics from uh, Peking University. Um, and I would say his uh, PhD advisor is a close collaborator of mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, his work concentrates on interdisciplinary field of AI for science. Um, many of you know all about AI for a wide range of different applications. This is specifically trying to do use AI to advance scientific research, which is a rather different uh, kind of thing than a lot of other applications for AI. So um, the work concentrates on machine learning, computational physics, computational chemistry, uh, computational materials, drug design, all those sorts of areas. Um, he's one of the major developers of the Deep uh, MD kit, which is an open source open source software platform for molecular simulation. And he's also been instrumental in um, pulling together a larger community called the Deep Modeling Community for AI for Science Enthusiasts. Um, his work has led to a number of interesting projects and recognitions, including uh, the 2020 ACM Gordon Bell Prize. For those of you in computational science, you know this is like the Nobel Prize for uh, scientific computing. Um, and it's been a feature on the Forbes, a feature on the cover of Forbes Asia. 30 under 30 list for 2022. And I've had the pleasure of uh, speaking to him quite regularly, mostly on Zoom calls, uh, as we're trying to do a little bit of work together um, scientifically, and also uh, interested in the whole area of AI for science. So without taking too much more time, let me, um, it's my pleasure to in introduce uh, Lin Feng and looking forward to what he has to tell us. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I will just speak without the microphone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Microphone. Okay, okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Dave. And also, thank, I would like to thank Tung Chi for the organization and other colleagues for uh, uh, organizing this event. Uh, I'm Lin Feng, and actually, I'm very not only uh, exciting, but actually it's really an honor and pleasure for me to uh, present something here, particularly after the three year pandemic uh, in mainland China and also uh, throughout the world. And uh, today I would like to talk about something like uh, called AI for science and from scientific discoveries to platform engineering. And I would like to maybe uh, try to explain uh, certain um, concepts and uh, from certain perspectives. perspectives. And um, maybe in the very beginning, let me just try to see, uh, we, we may need to just talk a bit about AI itself. So how many of you have the experience of like being, of touching ChatGPT? And maybe being touched by ChatGPT, right? <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's really uh, a new, like, um, new breaking point. And uh, I would like to just start from there because actually, when we uh, oh, maybe in the very beginning, roughly, we had the like uh, feeling of what AI for science would be. That was the beginning of a, a large boom of AI in maybe five to six years ago. And then actually there's a one more boom and we, we, we know that it's just the beginning. And then <clears throat> let me try to just start by some something maybe ab abstract, but, but I, I feel very interesting, relevant, and maybe uh, 
inspiring. So the, the, he, below is something I wrote actually on the plane uh, to Hong Kong. And I, went to, want to wrote, uh, I wanted to write something poetic and, because uh, we, we want to see, I want to see um, what would this kind of AI give us. And I started from the knowledge system because actually it's something like we um, based on for scientific research. Okay, then let's try to visualize and project the knowledge system uh, into something we are familiar with. The first thing is, like, if we consider our knowledge system as a complex and continuously evolving and graph structured compilation of human discoveries, um, I would, here I want to stra uh, stress graph structured. It's intercorrelated and it's quite complicated. And I just found one paper, uh, one actual video. If you look at this, it's like a network of science. It's uh, a network, very complicated, and it's a compilation of like all these nature papers of the, uh, from the past 150 years. And it's really complicated. And that's something that we uh, discover and then uh, move to our knowledge base. So it's graph structure. So, so then what's the best way to just represent and also um, to, to, to contain this uh, knowledge system is quite complicated. Then what, what are experts? So experts then may be seen as the explorers who delve into its depths, navigating and broadening its borders, borders through specific viewpoints. And as per, we, we get into some, the, the, the field, the domain from certain perspective and we go deep and we explore its border and that's experts. And then what's textbooks? And this is something I feel really interesting. And textbooks emerge as the lenses that coarse grain and transform the graph structured knowledge system into three stru uh, tree structured narratives, artificially, uh, artfully crafted by these very experts. So whenever we learn something, we start from, a, uh, particularly uh, when we are undergrad or even earlier, we start from, uh, from some textbooks. And we have these chapters sections and subsections and it's very clear a uh, tree structured knowledge system so going from graph structure to tree structure is always very interesting and it's not only about the knowledge system but also for example the uh an organization we have different department different uh sections and we have like in the company we have different also different departments and different um section that they are all graph structure or tree structured but actually essentially the object itself is graph structured not only graph structured but also reflective and maybe sometimes executable so then what's what are software software can be seen as knowledge system that is directly ex executable on machines and it's a compilation of the knowledge system and it's, it's a bridge to machines and it can easily be copied and uh be spread up, be spread out, and that's software. And finally, with all these considerations in mind, the current AI model system evolving towards at least the most sublim encoding of the graph, graph structure collective human knowledge, and also it's paired with a skillful decoding dance of prompts and prompts. It's just a hint where the knowledge or the information given to the AI system. And then given this prompt and given our questions or the, 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 given the context of the discussion, then it has a gen, generative feature and it's reflective. And then with this decoding dance of prompts and generative techniques, it can be done in an interactive way and it can learn things in an interactive way. So then actually in this point, uh, from, uh, just from this kind of abstract level or meta level thinking, um, what I re realized is actually uh, it's quite tricky to discuss the concept of AI for science because AI, the AI system itself and the concept and also its implications is evolving very quickly. And, oops. Is it stuck? Okay. Yeah. So the implications can be profound. The textbook based teaching system is some, something that we have a uni, typically uh, 
a standard of the textbook and it's very much the same thing for different kinds of students, but now we can center more on students and with different knowledge background and different purposes and different perspectives, we can learn things in different ways by generating textbooks for different people and using AI. And also for peer review based research system is facing, uh, are actually uh, faced with uh, a large amount of challenges. Think about the, the journals and the papers we're publishing and think about the, the overall, actually the feedback system come from the peer reviews. And right now, because of scale and also the, con of the in, in terms of the research itself and also the content we generated and given the generative power of AI, actually um, the, review, the review process and the review system is really uh, delicate in, in the sense that actually, uh, the reviewing, reviewing time and research time is on, on average paper is actually uh, decreasing significantly. And then ethics and also interdisciplinary collaborations are facing different situations. For, and I would say maybe even the discipline, the concept of discipline itself and the concept of department could change in like three to five years or five to 10 years. That's the implications. And then actually it's a quite complex concept. Uh, if you look at AI itself, then how we discuss AI for science, <laughs> then I have to say perspectives matter. And we can only just discuss these kind of things, at least in this talk from certain perspectives. And that's a general maybe description uh, of the AI system that is still quickly evolving and I would say it's evolving and also merging into not only our daily life, but also our research activities. Okay, then I will just look at these kind of things from different perspectives and try to, starting from these kind of perspectives to introduce what we are doing and also some point of view from these, <clears throat> these considerations. The first one is something like bottom up and static. I will explain later. What, 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 do, what does it mean by saying static? I would say uh, it's really something like whenever we have new technology, we can see a lot of opportunities directly made possible. For example, we, 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 we know the challenge uh, of microscope simulation is what 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 and we, we know the possibility given by AI is what will and do, we, then we do the combination and that's called something static we, we it's really a matter of time that makes it happen but actually uh, statistically and overall the community will evolve into that kind of solution that's something static and maybe low hand fruit sometimes the low hand fruit are not necessarily very uh, easy to obtain but uh, in general, these are static. So what's the um, starting point of the, this kind of static and bottom-up uh, possibilities? And that's actually just one thing. What um, made it technically possible uh, for AI for science? And it's really a, just a realization uh, of one thing, which is AI gave us tools, new tools for approximating high dimensional functions. And that's actually something when I uh, went to Princeton in 2016, uh, in that year, we had we have a very broad discussion on uh, AlphaGo, which actually previously we thought should belong to human beings, right? And then actually I was in the Department of Mathematics and uh, on, uh, advised by, co-advised by Professor Weinan and also Roberto Carr and when I just mentioned oh, you you should you, yeah you you, you you were a theory person but now you have to look at neural networks and machine learning because uh, when whatever theory you are trying to develop are stuck by one thing that's called curse of dimensionality and when I has have had a lot of for example uh, collaboration with Dave and uh, many other people and uh, for multi-scale computer uh, multi-scale uh, modeling and for 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 algorithm at different various different scales they just stuck by one they're just stuck by one thing uh, curse of dimensionality which is uh, 
even though you know the elementary theory going from Schrodinger equation to like fluid dynamics, you cannot solve these kind of functions effectively whenever the situation, the degree of freedom involved is large. So then actually it's a matter of how we represent and uh, how we obtain good representation for high dimensional functions and also then large amount of data. That's something AI gave us. So given this possibility, it brings us systematic opportunities to overcome the curse of dimensionality problem that has confronted the scientific computing community for a long time. Yeah, so that's the starting point. Given this realized, being realized, actually then we can see where are the static and so-called low-hand fruit, even though they are challenging. Then actually, let me just quote um, these three factors uh, presented by Damis Hassabis, the CEO of DeepMind. So what makes a suitable, makes for a suitable problem given this only one new uh, components added to our uh, possibility space? Then what, what makes for a suitable problem? There are three factors, massive combinatorial search space that makes the problem previously hard and then clear objective function or metric to optimize against. So for example, if we consider like uh, a certain scientific problem and it's really, the, the data itself requires a lot of reasoning and analysis, that's something maybe challenging, but it's really a matter of how to just make full use of this data by learning something, then it's, uh, it might be like a, a, an opportunity uh, directly <clears throat> possible to address. And then the third one is either lots of data were an accurate and efficient simulator. And we either need a large amount of data to address maybe the problem one and two, or we have, we, we have uh, a simulator to give us signals. And uh, definitely in the reinforcement learning scenario is like developed uh, in an iterative fashion so that we have this simulator and we simulate and we learn from our simulation and increase and uh, in, improve the simulator and definitely these are certain factors that may, may be addressed by this new technical possibility and <clears throat> i would say problems with these three factors directly satisfied can be viewed as low hand fruit <laughs> uh, because it's really a matter of time uh, and the community will evolve to that kind of solutions. And what are these possibilities? And actually, I, I think uh, there are, uh, what, what can these problems be? Uh, the case one is more data driven. So we, we have to think about all these components, the, the readiness of the model, the data, and the problem or the metric. So for the first one, protein folding, and I, I, don't, I think I don't need to explain too much about this problem and what it is, but let me just tell you that actually for this problem, before it's breakthrough in 2020 uh, by DeepMind in the CAS 14 competition, actually the data readiness is the following. We have like uh, 2 billion sequences, protein sequences, and we also have like um, roughly 200,000 uh, structures um, actually by experimental lists. So the problem itself is given the protein sequence, you predict the structure, the 3D structure, and then we have the sequence space detected. Uh, it's like 2 billion and also the amount is 2 billion and also we have 200,000 uh, structures solved. And then it's a matter of how we take full use of this kind of data and to just solve this Problem. And the metric is quite clear, right? So just the accuracy, the root mean square distance of the prediction, whatever, to measure the quality of the prediction. And then it makes a problem directly applicable. And then uh, definitely with this as a starting point, we need to develop a model and we need to consider domain constraint and domain, uh, domain, uh, domain knowledge to uh, maybe in inject that into the model architecture into the input and also into the loss function for training and then it's soft and then actually it's, it's just but it's hard but actually it's a very good problem to uh, to be addressed right and then actually after that we have to realize that there's not so many problems that satisfy such criterion clear objective function and also a large amount of data and we need to just um, develop model and uh, 
AI system for. And that's case one, but also certain similar uh, opportunities, uh, opportunities exist in many other areas like uh, chemical engineering and maybe like um, astrophysics. Yeah. And here's case two. Actually, whenever you don't have data itself, you, you could have data generators and the best data generators are our physical models and uh, translated into scientific computing uh, software, right? Uh, so, so our density functional theory and molecular dynamics and also fluid dynamics uh, <clears throat> simulations. And that's something uh, from my own research background uh, we, 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 we dig into. So uh, <clears throat> more physics based and I, I will explain later. And in this case, we have simulators, but typically a simulator is expensive in terms of uh, where the, the accuracy and e uh, efficiency cannot be made uh, <clears throat> possible uh, for both. So then uh, it's an issue of like generating data with expensive simulators and train the model and use the model to replace the expensive simulator and to do larger scale and longer time simulations. And that, 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 that's something uh, possible throughout all the scales of scientific computing and then integration of data and physics. And that, that's something roughly uh, if this data component or model or readiness of simulator, if th those are ready, then actually it, it makes a problem possible for uh, to be solved. And definitely in engineering, maybe uh, I will just uh, hand waving and, uh, and mention some, uh, something else, for example, to develop certain surrogate models for this mechanical system and to, 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 uh, to, to generate uh, maybe match points for, uh, for, 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 for simulations. And for all these uh, things, we could consider uh, certain scenarios and the readiness are the three factors I just mentioned. And then I will not go into details about the first one and alpha forward, but let me just introduce a bit about what we, uh, the starting point uh, of our uh, the, the, the research landscape that we have been uh, pursuing. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the starting point definitely uh, deep potential. Uh, it's actually also why we, we are called DP technology. Uh, I would say it's uh, in the very beginning, the, the objective is to have a unified framework for feeding the potential energy with AI. So previously, the problem is the following. We have two kinds of models, and we, 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 we care about the microscopic um, phenomena and systems, uh, including like uh, material system and also maybe those chemical reactions were um, uh, bio-related uh, phenomena. And, for all these things, actually, molecular dynamics gives us a uni unified tool to, uh, for, for, for performing the simulation and the theoretical background. And the only missing component is how these different particles are interact with each other. And then there comes two kinds of solutions. One is just to solve this equation uh, on the fly and, and produce the energy and forces uh, applied on each uh, <clears throat> atoms using uh, electronic structure theories. And the beginning I am make, uh, making it possible is actually in 1985, the Carl Parnello scheme. And the report is that uh, happened to be my, uh, another of my co-advisors. So I have to convince him that <laughs> the AI solution will just, uh, just make it even, uh, <clears throat> make this uh, more uh, accessible to more possible uh, problems. And, but definitely because we need to uh, solve electronic structure and solve this uh, quantum uh, mechanics problem on the fly during our simulation of the atomic system, uh, it's quite uh, expensive and typically we, uh, it's accurate and the accuracy is guaranteed by these ab initio methods, even though in certain cases they are, maybe we still need to just see uh, they are uh, accurate enough or not. But in general, it's accurate but expensive. It can only deal with like typically 100 to 100 atoms and uh, on time span of 10 to 100 uh, picoseconds. That's something uh, that's, that defines its application domain because of the limitation of the uh, computational cost. And then <clears throat> the second level of theory is uh, direct or empirical uh, based uh, empirical and molecular dynamics. So then in that case, we model uh, the potential energy uh, profile for different system with different 
uh, formula based on uh, physical analysis or empirical rules. And in those cases, <clears throat> in for 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 simple systems, it works pretty uh, fine. But typically, for like multi-component and also for a system with different uh, different kinds of like defects or different uh, phases, then it faces challenges. So th this empirical <coughs> interaction-based uh, molecular dynamics could be very fast, but maybe limited by uh, by their accuracy in for com complicated and complex phenomena, and that's the situation. So uh, that's a dilemma faced by the community maybe for over thirty years. And then I will not talk into detail, but we can see that it's really a very well posed machine learning problem. You are given the atomic positions and the, their chemical species, and the prediction is the energy and forces, and that's it. Although there are many, many considerations like uh, symmetry, locality, and the continuous property, and also the gradient, whatever. But that's something satisfying the three factors. And then we, we can think about general solutions, not only specific solutions for different types of system, but something general. What could be a neural network structure that can satisfy these all requirements, accurate, efficient, and also satisfy the uh, physical constraints. Uh, that's why. Uh, that's how this uh, deep potential. And actually, uh, meanwhile, there were uh, different uh, kinds of attempts uh, uh, in that time period. And then, uh, uh, deep, deep, deep potential gave us a, a kind of unification of computing efficiency and accuracy. And one uh, milestone is that actually, uh, after the releasing of the methodology, we also have this open source software and have a lot of applications. And then by integrating uh, both AI and these physical models and high performance computing, uh, we reached a milestone of 2020 ACM Golden Bell Prize, pushing them to the limit. And we did a simulation of like 100 million uh, atoms with ab initial accuracy, which actually increased the possibility for like five to six order of magnitude. And uh, that, that's something uh, I would say, although low hand fruit, technically challenging, but actually it's something like we could consider. And these are systematic opportunities. Definitely beyond the deep potential, there are systematic opportunities from micro to uh, micro to macro scales because we have all these multi scale models and we are faced with typically a unified scenario is a dilemma between the accuracy of the. Uh, or may basic level or more microscopic level model and the efficiency of the uh, macroscopic ones and how we uh, get both. And then in that scenario, we can try to think about methodologies to, um, to use the microscopic models as, uh, as data generators and train a macroscopic one, uh, model and then to uh, <clears throat> like a surrogate model, and then we use a macroscope model to perform simulations. So that's why starting from, from deep potential, we also developed downscale. We, we have like models from more accurate quantum chemistry uh, data to density functional models, and more like uh, for fluid mechanics and for Boltzmann equations, uh, I would say uh, Professor Winnie also just uh, leads all this development of this kind of new uh, methodologies and to 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 uh, and new solutions to all these kind of scientific computing tasks okay that that's one thing uh, so so the uh, a landscape that uh, give us systematic opportunities and the the theme is actually unified right so <laughs> and definitely for application domain beyond dft is actually for certain kinds of uh, applications. Let's just also re rethink about the factors. What are the data? What is the problem? What could be a good metric for the pro problem? And what, however, uh, at what level the physical uh, simulator can <clears throat> play a role? And all such things. And then we can develop solutions to uh, problems uh, in in different application domains. For example, here uh, for uh, material science, I will just give the whole landscape. Maybe. Uh, but actually, uh, what we need to do is to fuse informatics and physics 
uh, <laughs> intelligently and choose the right combo of AI and physics for a given challenge. For example, there are cases that actually the uh, physical si simulations are directly applicable, but kind of expensive, then we can use AI to reduce the computational cost and to replace the original model with AI models. And then there are also some other cases where actually data is quite limited. And it's the, the property we care about cannot be directly obtained by, from physical simulations. But actually what we can do is the X, the input space could be structured, for example, for organic molecules and for these structures, we could just start from these input, the structures to train a model that is pre-trained with some unsupervised uh, techniques. And using this pre-trained model, to, uh, we, we can better train, uh, translate or, or transfer to different applications. And that's actually the Unimo, uh, the, the, maybe I would say the algorithm system that we uh, going from, uh, going from a <clears throat> pre-trained model for several uh, different kinds of property prediction tasks, including those in drug discovery and materials dis discovery. And so, so the, it, re, with the technical uh, boost and the po new possibility of AI, it's really a matter of how we integrate these components for certain problems. And a similar thing happens in drug discovery. And I would say drug discovery have a, maybe this industry itself is large and also uh, highly risky, but actually it has a relatively clear uh, pipeline for drug uh, for development, particularly for uh, organic uh, small drugs. And then going from this, the structure uh, prediction, we just mentioned alpha fold, and then we have uh, we need to just see the pocket where uh, the drug could target at, and then actually it requires simulation for uh, finding this pocket. And also then we have docking, uh, that's something computing based. And then actually when we did have a hit, or have, uh, have, 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 some, <coughs> uh, have can, some candidate with a fit, good affinity possibility, and then we, we can just perform some later simulations. And, but for, for the downstream uh, properties, we don't have physical models, then we need to some data-driven procedures. But it's really an integration of both that we can have better solutions. And the solutions can be integrated and iterated with the certain uh, industry and uh, in application domain. Okay, so th this is mostly what we have been doing in the past five years. So there remain several challenges for, for them. Some are fundamental, representing anti-symmetric functions for solving the Schrodinger equations directly. That's still a hard question uh, because we, now we have good ways to represent symmetric and also uh, satisfy these, all these like E3 equivariance symmetries. And for those kind of stuff, we have good solutions, but we don't have, still don't have a good solution for anti-symmetric functions. Or a general theory for plasticity, we have a theory for elasticity, right? But for, for any kind of massive scale theory and model, it's hard to develop and hard to analysis. What could AI, um, these new tools help us? Uh, it's, a it's really uh, not so clear. But for many others, it's a matter of time. So, 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 so the, it's really how and when it will happen, but it will definitely happen. And that's something uh, I would say the examples I just gave are belongs to this scenario. But then the next topic is maybe an, a bit more dynamic because so even though we know something would happen, how it will happen, it's really a process of address, address emerging bottlenecks during the scaling up process towards a new possible systematic solution. Um, Okay, so then actually I want to have a, I, let me just try to revisit the development of deep, deep potential in this way. So although we are faced with this, the, this, on, this problem of representing the pronoun energy, it's really a joint development, a systematic development of all this model, data, application, software, and community. And by only just addressing properly the bottom nags emerged along the, the process, 
uh, in different places, we can have a good development of the whole new ecosystem. And that's a dynamical point of view. So in the very beginning, it's a matter of model development. And because, because of time limitation, I will not go into details, but let me tell you that in the very beginning, it's really a matter of like how we represent a model uh, satisfying certain physical constraint like symmetries. And so what's crucial is combining both physics and AI, the new possibility given by AI and also the physical considerations. We need to just properly choose a good point that is not so constrained by so-called uh, domain knowledge, and, but also not so uh, generalized by this black box. So that's something, we, uh, we, uh, something tricky and cr crucial. And that's the model development part. But actually, I would say like there are two, uh, these are just in the very beginning, it's just how we develop model. But after the model is developed, definitely we could have some many, many new possibilities for model development. But I would say like after in the, the model in the beginning, then actually it's the, the, the key bottlenecks quickly change to other places. So I would say the, the, through all this, for years, the model development part, although the whole community is quite active in this region, actually uh, it's quite flat for us because of the something here. Definitely I will mention later that it will go up. It, it is going up last, from last year to now. Why is that? Because of data accumulation and application. It's really a slow process. In the very beginning, we, we, uh, this kind of methodology is applied to those groups that with DFT data, because then they can try that, oh, given my DFT data, can the model fit the data? And that's the very beginning. Then if the model can fit data, then we can think about how to generate data to develop a more general purpose model for research purposes. And that's very beginning. But then actually as we, uh, <coughs> the application do domain increased, actually um, what, what, what's crucial is a more end-to-end -end solution. So, so the, we, we need to take care of several specific uh, requirements from different uh, applications. For example, when Tongqi developed the uh, model for, <clears throat> we, we, we have the special procedure because we need to just make sure that for alloy system with the, the defects properties can be, uh, can, uh, can be addressed properly. Right? And when we deal with, we consider combustion, the magnitude of energy and forces will be much larger than normal applications and three, hundred, uh, three order of magnitude larger, then we need to just develop a certain a better training scheme. Now all this makes it possible for different uh, application and that requires some joint development of methodology person and application person and to integrate the solution into still the open source software. And that's something tricky and require a, a matter of time. Um, that, but definitely we, we have all these uh, applications and there's a good review uh, by Tung Chi and also <clears throat> Dave. Uh, the potential for material science, uh, it summarized uh, some recent uh, applications of the potential. And uh, actually, I, I would say there have been like hundreds of papers published by using this new methodology. <clears throat> but if you look at the, here, applications are still, it's, are still, it's really a matter of accumulating data and constructing the infra. So then it's, it comes infra at scale. So when, after we make sure that the solution makes sense to different application domains, we we will start to think about thinking about how to just develop the model and data in more uh, in a more systematic way, so that afterwards the the, the the community will be given like a set of models that are directly applicable, and that's actually the idea starting from 2018. Uh, but I would say the 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 challenge is that. <clears throat> What we originally, what we do is actually, I, I can only just use my personal computer to do all this training and simulation to verify that the model works. And then we have our clusters. But even though we have the computing uh, resources, local and clusters, it's still not, um, not so efficient because whenever we have a new computational pattern, the previous uh, solution could not just be the best solution. We, and in this case, actually, it's very like, very much like high throughput computing. And we, we, we have a batch jobs, uh, DFT jobs, generating data and the train the model. After training, we use the model to explore the landscape of the confirmation 
uh, space, and then we actually generate more DFT. We, we select those uh, models, uh, confirmations that the model is not uh, accurate enough, and then actually we send the confirm, uh, uh, confirmations or the snapshots to DFT calculation, and we do this iteratively. And if we do this iteratively, actually, for DFT calculation, we need us to spread the jobs out. And if we do this to a larger scale, then actually computing resources will be a bottleneck. And that's why, actually, I would say a milestone uh, for computing is not only the HPC award, uh, Gordon Bell, but also actually, actually in 2020, we decided to, and we also became the, the early practitioners for uh, building up a cloud native scientific computing system. And that, that helped, helps us to smoothly go through the data accumulation process. And th that's how these kind of uh, structures are developed. I, and I will go into details later. But what's essential now becomes platform engineering. We need good infra infrastructure and platforms for better utilizing and scaling up this new technology. And now, then what? Then as the application increase, actually data, the amount of data is increasing and increasing so that actually the, even the whole periodic table is being covered, starting to be covered. And then it's a, it, it's a good, then it's a timing for developing a new kind of model. And that's why the model here has an increase here, right? So, so it's because now we have enough data. Previously, five years ago, we don't. And then with enough data, it's a, then we have the possibility to develop a pre-trained model. Uh, given a pre-trained model, what, what would be the benefit? The benefit would be like uh, for any downstream applications, the effort required to do application for further model development and also for further data generation or for further simulations would be like reduce one or two order of magnitude. For them, when we consider alloy system, and here is the early experiment, uh, experiment uh, last year, when, when we consider high entropy alloys, we, for example, we consider five or six elements. Then if we train a model from scratch, we need a, a, a much larger amount of uh, data if, uh, compared with uh, if we have a pre-trained model and use this model to, uh, to do transfer learning because it already encodes all this um, element information and also local chemical information in the pre-trained representation. So if you look at these curves, actually uh, for, for uh, the x-axis is the number of samples and y-axis is the accuracy. So with, uh, with the number of samples, one or even two order of magnitude less, uh, we, we can achieve same accuracy. And that's a possibility uh, brought by pre-trained models. And definitely we need a process to uh, make it better and better, but actually I would say uh, it's, a, it's the bottleneck that is uh, emerging uh, during the scaling up process of the data model and applications. And then what's the next emerging bottleneck? So if we have a pre-trained model, then actually we, we will have the opportunity to start, to uh, so go from the unified model to more applications and even for generative tasks. If we consider the name of GPT, it's really a matter, it, it's three kinds of technology. Generative, that, that is generative uh, model and then pre-train is uh, like what I'm, uh, I'm introduced here. And transformer is a, a certain model architecture. And a com good combination of these three things would give us new possibilities. And that's what this pre-trained model is heading towards. But then the next step is that if we have enough data and the metric is so clear, then the model developed part will be standardized and passed to AI as per. Previously, we need to steal many physical knowledges, and, but, but now it's a very standard a machine learning uh, problem. But still, a model evaluation system is in urgent need because for downstream, for all these applications, Right now, previously we maybe just use one model for several years, but now maybe we have one more, we, we have several models one day, and then we need to choose which one we would be needed or would be applied to our application. And then uh, testing system and evaluation system will be very important. And to build up, build up all these 
testing, evaluation, and application systems, then actually the work, a good workflow fr framework uh, and various workflows will be important and they will play a role uh, between platform and domain developers. Yeah, and that's something like after the pre-trained model, even though it's still under development, not by only by us, but also by the whole community, uh, I would say maybe this will be the next bottom up during the scaling up process. And maybe what's next, then I think we could just talk to experimental list and to see what will be our problem. But I, well, through the development of AI, I would say maybe like a cross modality pre-trained model for both structure, atomic structure and property, and also experimental characterization data will be important. And that's the process. Okay, so that's the second one, the dynamical point of view. It's really a matter of scaling up things and addressing the bottom knobs, emerging at different components. And then we, we, we have to just uh, overcome uh, the, the barriers at different, uh, uh, at different points. And some of the barriers are technical and maybe uh, require more uh, background in algorithm. Some requires more engineering and some require more integration of this domain and different domains and also the technology. And the third one is more top down and static. And then given this uh, possibility, previously what we uh, say is bottom up because we, we just want to see the opportunities in different areas that is ready for this new AI uh, technology and how we integrate uh, as a integrate them as a dynamical process. And the third one is a more top-down and static view. What we the whole picture of after all this dynamical process and after uh, all these uh, new opportunities become re reality. And I would say a top-down view is that we really need, what we really need is uh, like something like a, a Linux platform for scientific research and development. And that's something I would, try to just explain and elaborate a bit more. So what is platform about? Uh, it's, it's really something that uh, developed to reduce complexities and scaling up things, I would say. So consider uh, our Linux were, uh, were whatever, the Android and our the Kubernetes, if you are uh, familiar with cloud, uh, then actually those are things that actually in the, up front and downstream, there are several different players and we, we want to encourage in innovation, but then actually we need a platform to uh, kind of, um, uh, and certain APIs to kind of integrate different possibilities and integrate different kinds of hardware and integrate different kinds of software solutions. And that's called a platform. And the platform, <clears throat> if developed properly, uh, we can just allow the, <clears throat> uh, innovation from both downstream and upfront uh, in a more in a larger scale, and that that's something uh, made possible by uh, by a good platform. So think about a situation when 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 we have a model architecture like Deep Potential. If we don't have frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, then actually it's really a matter of a PhD period to develop such solution to realize that on computers and to test it and to make good models for one or two systems. That's a five year period. period. But given this, given this uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch flap framework, actually it's a matter of actually in the very beginning, uh, in, my in the end of my first, my PRD, uh, first year of my PRD uh, study, actually we, we just have this proof of concepts results presented by to Roberto and Wena, and they, they just said, oh, maybe this could be your PhD thesis topic. And, and that's it. And at that time, it was 2017. Uh, we just have the 0 0.10 version of TensorFlow. And then I came back uh, to China in May. And actually, in July, we already have this DeepMD kit released open source and uh, already working for a lot of systems. And that's, uh, then PRD period down. <laughs> it's really impressive that given good, uh, good platforms, the, the, the efficiency and also uh, the, the process of realizing new ideas and testing them and for discoveries will be uh, made way more 
efficient. And we really need such kind of platforms. But actually, that uh, previously it belongs to more industry, uh, in, in industrial applications, because uh, typically um, in like research systems, we uh, uh, typically are more independent and small scale uh, innovation uh, dominant. Okay, so then what, what will be uh, the platform? Uh, I will just quickly <laughs> mention, introduce, uh, and also in this way introduce uh, what are the um, two organizations I'm, I've been involved are doing. Uh, one is what is AI for Science Institute doing? It, it's, it has the name of AI for Science. So actually what it, its target is to develop the platform system for the whole community. Um, <clears throat> what are the platform systems with the current boom of AI. Uh, uh, this is uh, the current version of the platform. So actually, we think four components or four pillars will be important. Uh, so the efficient, accurate fundamental models, uh, including the models I just mentioned, and also including the models that is uh, being developed, uh, the pre-trained models for uh, as a new starting point for the whole community, and also efficient, accurate experimental uh, characterization tools uh, like all these experimental facilities, and they, they are actually the lens uh, for new discoveries and also uh, something that the, all this equipment that we can use to, for discoveries and for uh, creating new things. And literature-based knowledge system. Definitely we now have a unified model, but how we integrate lit literature system, and now we have like maybe millions of papers published each, each year, how we just uh, extract useful information and for <clears throat> for whatever purpose becomes a problem. And uh, there are just highly correlated knowledge network system and also graph structured, not only just pure information, how we just have a better ways to, for a, or, or a new version of Google Scholar, what it, will it look like? And also highly integrated computing system. And that's the four pillars that we see important for the platform. And also in, oops. Okay, so in DP technology, what we're doing is previously what we thought was that we were given this new algorithms, we want to apply that to like drug discovery and uh, maybe material discovery uh, applications. And maybe that's something uh, this in, in industrial software and the industrial solutions. And that's something we thought we would like to address. But the problem is, is that before addressing that, we need a good platform uh, for internal research and development and also for like, the whole community. And, and that's why actually what we realized was that the first part, the, a platform for scientific research as a service is very important, not only for us, but also for the whole community and for us to address the problem downstream. So because then with this, product, what we can do is actually uh, elastic com computing and uh, spreading out a uh, joint development of certain solutions and also uh, sp spreading out quickly testing new ideas. If you are uh, familiar with the, the AI community is very much like uh, what Hugging Face is doing that's for developing a new model and new uh, demos and you can we can just quickly integrate them and to, to, to uh, pass that to like real application uh, situations. And that's Oh, what what we realized and platform engineering and a platform based product is really not only an opportunity but also the emerging bottleneck for the whole community. Okay, so the last one is then a bit more top down and dynamical. So given this uh, viralization of what would the platform look like and uh, and also what it is possibly it will. Uh, address, then how we achieve that is a dynamical point of view. And it, then I would say it's really joint effort needed for a new paradigm for scientific discoveries and industrial applications. Um, then I, maybe I will just mention three things, but one thing for one sentence. One is the open source community. And actually tomorrow we'll have this workshop based on all these open source solutions. And I guess, uh, uh, to, um, people here will just uh, pay more attention. And actually, what we realize is the open source community is really something to uh, collaborate and to communicate ideas and to leverage the solutions to uh, 
uh, <clears throat> different application domains. So if you look at the modeling now, we already have like 48 repos uh, uh, and projects uh, de uh, under development and deep kit and uh, other solutions to uh, different application uh, domains are being developed. And oops, uh, I think I have a QR code here, but actually this one is a new one, Apex, right? just released last, uh, last week, <laughs> and you will see it tomorrow in the workshop. And the second one is, oops, uh, AIS Square. So it has an interesting name, actually, uh, AI for Science. AI, AI stands for both ab initial and artificial intelligence. So it's AI squared. And the square is also a place for communication and uh, for deploying all these solutions. So it's, uh, it's now developed towards uh, <clears throat> a place to share and evaluate, evaluate and deploy model data sets and workflows for scientific research. And also <clears throat> to, 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 to emerge new solutions throughout uh, this way. And finally, actually what's being developed in uh, DP technology is a platform for, um, <clears throat> for teaching and research in the age of AI for science. So uh, what it requires is that uh, what we realized is a notebook based um, <clears throat> curriculum development and also elastic and scalable computing power and project based collab collaborative environment and also efficient deployment while launching. And that's something we found important to better communicate ideas and to develop uh, things. And you will see this, and actually this is a Borum notebook, uh, and this is a teaching materials tomorrow in the workshop. And I think Tunchi and uh, uh, I had another students in Dave's group will just uh, do this part and we'll have other topics and you're welcome to participate and what i what we realized is that we now we have many many models many many uh, so-called solutions and it's really a matter of how we can efficiently get a touch of those solutions and maybe touched by those solutions just uh, like what i mentioned in the beginning like chat gpt it's there are tons of technologies behind this product but how we just better organize the development and innovations based on this platform and how we pass new solutions and useful solutions towards the applications and how we test them so that those those what are those are those, those doesn't work will just <laughs> disappear and maybe a peer review process is not so effective compared with all this hands-on process that's something i want to introduce uh, as a last part Okay. Uh, oops. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Um, we take an opportunity to give everybody a chance to uh, ask any questions you may have. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks for all the very interesting and sharing. Especially, I mean, you from a very high level to introduce. I mean, yeah, I learned a lot. So, uh, I have a very general question. Especially uh, in the slides, visualization and the projection of knowledge. Uh, you mentioned that the the large language model or foundation model can somehow uh, encode the knowledge from I mean observational data mm -hmm. or some others, and then we have the promote. That means we can utilize this knowledge. So uh, I wanted to maybe you can share. So it, it is possible to visualize this knowledge or I mean, at least let us know which knowledge we can utilize because somehow this is about the interpretation. Yeah, maybe for the scientific discovery, this is important. I mean, yeah. increase the transparency. I think this is a very difficult. I wanted to just get your comments or sharing about this. Yeah, this is a very challenging topic, and actually, I I'm still thinking about it, and I I think I uh, I learned a lot from a talk by Rod Hoffman, a computational chemist, because he thought he was beaten several times by 
uh, from starting from the computing, uh, scientific computing in the very beginning to AI to the new era of AI. So, so, uh, so then what we I learned is like if you want to real, uh, re really try to realize, it's really uh, the realization may come from an interactive process, and you you try to play in the very beginning and play with it, and then try to. Uh, maybe use it to do something and teach other people what, what it is and then you you, you try to lead, uh, develop some sort of leadership to 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 do to to, to 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 communicate with the system and that's that could be a process so what, what I, I was shocked several times by the interaction with for example <laughs> chat gpt uh, for, I, I will just give one example of maybe one and a half. One is actually when we developed all these notebook systems, it can help us writing Jupyter notebooks, not only Python languages, and just a, a, a well-developed Jupyter notebook. And for, for the prerequisites and for, for all these details, and it can help us debug. And one time, I, I think last weekend, we were trying to just analyze some data using AIC. So it's just a very commonly used package for um, microscopic modeling and just to visualize the structure. And if I, I actually I forgot how to realize the cell uh, box and how to make it. Then I, I think I have a very good searching skill. So, so I forgot to use uh, ChatGPT and start, I started searching uh, on Google and on the docs of AIC. I didn't get any answer until 20 minutes later, I, 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 it came to me, oh, I, have, I could ask it. And it, it gave, gave me certain possibilities of why, why you cannot realize it and set uh, PBC, true, 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 and then it solves solve the problem. Yeah, definitely is the, the knowledge itself is hidden in the tree structure doc, but it's just, you, you have to search it. And searching could be like one directional, but it could also be interactive and the interactive process just make it even more possible more possible so the, i i just realized the system in these specific ways <laughs> yeah 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 that's why prompt becomes a new domain uh, expertise because uh, you you that's you you, you definitely you, you we, we could just learn how to come uh, how to in, in interact with the system and how we ask questions that, that's always a key uh, how we raise <laughs> questions and that's always something crucial yeah and that's why i want to mention in the beginning that perspectives really matter any question uh hi uh uh, I just, uh, uh, first of all, uh, very informative uh, lecture. Um, I, I really learned a lot about like uh, how you use the AI for uh, mostly fundamental sciences, right? Uh, like physics or chemistry or, you know, material sciences. Uh, but but you know, I, I'm now in those areas. I actually work in uh, like finance mm -hmm. uh, domains. So how, how, do, um, how do we see that AI can really impact the research for uh, like business research or mm -hmm. social sciences? Sure, I think this is a good question in general. Uh, still, I, I maybe in the very beginning, it's what could, what makes for a good topic, the, the three factors, you, if, you're, if you still remember, uh, uh, that's something to consider in the beginning. And later on, it's a platform engineering. Let's just focus on the first thing. So what makes for a good problem to to be solved by ai so for finance i'm not an expert but definitely we have <laughs> we have good friends here right and also uh, in uh, in academia so if you have a good model it's hard to solve that then it's a good beginning for games and for maybe heterogeneous agent models right for these situations it, you really need a lot of like empirical uh, <laughs> intermediate level uh, uh, model to solve those models e efficiently. If uh, e e then, if you're given this new tool uh, for games and for for this heterogeneous a agent, you can better just solve these models. And that's one thing. And if you, uh, I would highly recommend a paper Deep Ham 
<laughs> maybe deep heterogeneous agent model. And that, that kind of thing could be one possibility. Starting from a model, you can better solve it. And definitely in finance and economics, it's, we don't have models like Schrodinger equation, right? We don't have this fundamental ground truth, maybe at, at least at certain level, at a starting point. Then uh, we need data and we, we need, bet, need to better integrate data in, in models. And in that case, uh, things become a bit more complicated. And, and then maybe I would just <laughs> recommend going from model based to, uh, <clears throat> you, you, if you dig into the topic in this way, you will find many, many relevant data driven <laughs> modeling process, but I, I, I can hardly comment on that. <laughs> Thank you. That's another question. Uh, hi, uh, very nice talk. Uh, so I, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is about data. Uh, I, I want to know that how do you collect your data just from uh, the simulation or from the lab? And do you need to pre-process the data or are you just using some raw data to train your model? That's the first question. And the second question is that uh, uh, here uh, from, uh, I just think that you use AI models to, to discover some new uh, scientific uh, technology. So in this process, um, for, for me, I just think that AI some, sometimes looks like uh, some black box and we cannot know uh, what really happens inside the, the, the AI model. But for the scientific discovery, it seems where it, it is important for us to know what, what happened. So, uh, and you just said that you use representation learning, you know, such kind of things. Uh, so I want to know, is that representations generated by AI model, is, uh, are, them, uh, are they interpretable? Can we, uh, can we understand the mm -hmm. property of them or uh, if uh, can we use the AI model to guide us to f discover new? There are maybe a lot of questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a couple of questions. I will just quite yeah, try to answer uh, in the most proper way. And the first one is clear. So about data uh, collection and and maybe data cleaning. And yeah, so <clears throat> it, 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 it's definitely very critical to prepare and to. Uh, to maybe process the data, pre-process the data. And it's really depend, uh, depending on what the model is and what's our objective. It's really correlated. So for example, if we just uh, consider uh, what I just mentioned, deep, deep potential. In the very beginning, uh, in, in, in many domain of scientific research, we, don't, we have limited data. But what we are lucky here is that we have an accurate simulator as in the beginning so we can generate data through expensive calculations and that's the dft data giving us given the atomic structure we have energy and forces and then energy and forces are directly the quantities we want to want our ai model to predict in that case we don't need to just do much on this more, uh, data pre-processing uh, loop However, uh, so the, uh, this is highly correlated with model. So in the very beginning, people not necessarily think, uh, don't necessarily think that uh, symmetries are important. Then actually a molecule and the molecule rotated along a certain direction are two kind of input. Definitely with symmetry properly addressed, that's one data point. Mm -hmm. But if not, then actually that becomes two and more data point and you need data augmentation techniques to just help you increase your uh, the representation of the data domain so that's that's highly correlated with the design of model and then after we make sure that given the data we can feed in data then the problem is that for for a new application what's the least what's the minimum set of data we need to train a model that requires active learning process right so so that you're given given you some certain data and you train the model and the model may not be accurate enough for the uh, application domain and you use the model to do simulations and find some uh, snapshots that is not accurate and then you do further DFT calculations to generate more data and then data generative process is then made iterative and through an active learning procedure and then if you are familiar with uh, large language models and there are f furthermore some other uh, things to be done like reinforced learning from hu human feedback, right? RLHF. That's some data uh, generation process through 
a more even more interactive procedure. And that, that, so data labeling and data cleaning is highly correlated with the task and the model construction. That's the first one. And, and then for, 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 for a second one, can you remind me one? Uh, the, yeah, maybe uh, the, I want to know that if we can understand the AI. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, we actually we, 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 we tried a lot uh, to understand the model, uh, how it works. And I would say because actually my background is in the very beginning, it's more in math, right? And in math department of Princeton, so actually on parallel with all these scientific applications, uh, one of my advisor, Wynan, actually spent a lot of time with all our colleagues to study why neural networks work. And there are definitely several um, interesting discoveries and several uh, translated into theorems, uh, like universal approximation theorem. After that, we have like defined the uh, domain of the function that is suitable for high dimensional uh, cases and for the neural network for representing and training. However, I would say in general, and, and actually uh, this is not only like uh, some mathematical uh, games, but also actually uh, when I last year was invited in the, four, uh, in the ICM, International uh, Congress of Math, uh, to give this plenary talk on this math mathematical theory for neural networks. Uh, However, I would say uh, the speed of <laughs> uh, deep understanding of these things, uh, the development is always behind the development of the application side. So understanding AI system, in my view, maybe personally, uh, is as hard as uh, AI means artificial intelligence, right? As hard as <laughs> understanding a human intelligence. So when you are teaching a student, it's also like a black box, right? So you, you, you have many, many empirical findings. Uh, empirical ones really works, right? So the, like the hyperparameters, the settings, how to uh, clean the data and how to just scale up on like 10,000 GPUs for one model, right? That's something you require many heuristics and many uh, empirical uh, experiences. However, how deep we understand it is, I would say it's as hard as understanding human intelligence. How, how do you understand how we, we ourselves learn and <laughs> understand things? I would say it's still very challenging. But I, I was just going to add, in, in order to do science with this, I think the interesting approach is, you know, if you learn and have enough examples of be able to test ideas to uh, you know, look at a lot of different cases, you get enough background. So when you try to develop a theory yourself to understand, you're, you have a much more constrained uh, uh, thing to try to understand. So for example, you know, it's always easier from simulation, you do a simulation, you, you learn how something works. But when you try to develop a theory, it always helps to know the answer in advance. And then you can go back and try to figure out how do you actually derive that theory. So I think having AI there, it, does, it doesn't give you the new theories for what's happening in the science. But what it does, it's an enabler to, for you to develop the theory yourself. Um, that's yeah. where I find it useful. Yeah. I, I was just going to take a question also ask a question about uh, data and you know developing these kinds of models you know like you you mentioned for example you do things like um we do things like uh density functional theory or something like that to feed to train the models yeah. and you know that's great but sometimes we find out the density functional theory doesn't work well enough yeah. You know, it's not a it's not an exact solution to the Schrodinger equation. So, but we often also have random sets of experimental data. Yes, yes. How do you combine okay. both of those kinds of things? That's, actually, that's something really uh, interesting, and uh, we were solving this problem in two directions. One is definitely to develop a better machine learning based density functional theory that's in the deep ks okay, project and 
to better integrate experiment data is really something we need to explore. And let's just uh, still focus on force fields. Definitely, uh, DFT can give us a good starting point, but how to just uh, further improve the, um, the performance of the force field, maybe we, then we, we could have some experiment data and to use it. And actually, for this purpose, we developed one more project named DMFF, Differentiable Molecular Force Field. I, I will just uh, mention two important uh, factors to achieve this goal. One is actually the, the, the coding framework. So previously, what makes it hard to integrate uh, explanatory result? It's because it's not a directly, it's not, a, the, typically, experimental properties are not those directly generated by the model. For example, we, we, we have statistical properties like RDF, radio distribution function, and diffusion, and also we have il, some mechanical properties and some thermodynamic properties. Those properties are obtained, if, even if we can just obtain those properties through computation, it's a, probably obtained from some specific simulation protocols, not directly from a prediction of the model. It's mm -hmm. a model inference, uh, like it, it gives us any reinforcement and evolves signal for a long time, and then we we'll obtain it. And that makes it hard to like, directly fit the, uh, the, the, the property to the, uh, to fit the model against these properties. And then actually we, what we need is some coding framework work like TensorFlow to realize this and in terms of model construction and also model fitting so that we can better just, whenever we implement some new construction on the model, we can just obtain the gradients uh, naturally, not just, just for, uh, uh, not, not taking too much effort to obtain these quantities. And then when, when doing fitting for each different kinds of property like statistical, static and dynamical and also mechanical, we need new fitting uh, algorithms. Mm -hmm. yeah, so previously, uh, one popular one, uh, <laughs> algorithm, very straightforward, is actually just to do this gradient through this simulation trajectory. But definitely, uh, if we, we are familiar with all these statistical mechanics and also maybe mechanics, it's, it's not a good way. So we need to just take care of these uh, statistical properties to, uh, to better develop algorithm to fit data. But that's possible, and that's under development. Mm. Right. I think it's an interesting case where you always we use DFT as yeah. sort of, as our truth, but then we find out there's all these places where DFT fails. And, yes, yes. Um, and for very complex reasons, but we do have experimental data which seem very simple. <laughs> we just yes, did it yes, wrong. yes, yes. Uh, some simple ones like lattice con uh, constant and m many others could be added as constraint as in the feeding process. And that's something really, uh, I would say, deserve further uh, like development. OK, any last questions? One more here. Okay. Last question. OK, uh, thank you, Dr. Zhang. Uh, very uh, thank you so much for your fantastic sharing on the uh, AI-based potential. Uh, I have a question on the, uh, on the real advantages of, the, of, of your AI-based deep potential. Uh, I'm doing some research in the DFT uh, calculations for uh, physics, chemistry, or some material-based things, and I have, uh, uh, and I, uh, and as far as I know, uh, uh, to use the uh, AI-based deep potential, you should, uh, for example, to to use it doing some research in one properties of a materials, uh, you you should use the database including the properties. Uh, very close to such uh, su such properties. For example, you want to use such potential to calculate the uh, energy related uh, things. You have to you have to uh, input some uh, some some uh, some data just uh, very close to such properties. So I think uh, this is some uh, some some trick. I think based on my uh, on my thinking. So uh, maybe uh, maybe in in the future uh, we, we we can use a more uh, more uh, more more much more better uh, potential to do a more combined things. For example, the uh, electron phonon coupling for mm -hmm. uh, for for superconducting uh, calculation based on the BCS theory. Uh, for example, this is one thing. And another thing is that I think uh, all of the uh, all of the things based on the accelerating the computation 
it, it is not a uh, it is not a true uh, solution to the problem because uh, uh, for, uh, with the increase of the computational resources and its uh, performances, I think all of this uh, all of the things for acceleration were it is not a good solution to the problem. For example, uh, about ten years ago. Uh, uh, the, the computers maybe cannot do a good calculations for the GW calculation. I, I'm not very, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if you know that. Uh, the GW calculation is for the accurate description of the energy levels of mm -hmm. a, uh, of a, uh, of a, of a materials with, uh, with electron, electron coupling. Uh, and people, uh, because people have not such a good machines to do such calculations, people use, uh, some, something uh, some, some some other potentials, for example, the EVGGA to doing this for very uh, short uh, times. But now the EVGGA has become a history, and yes. the, because um, because everybody can do the GW, almost everybody can do GWs on their computational platforms. So my question is, if just if you just want to do the acceleration, I think this is not a final solutions to the problem, and maybe. Uh, the acceleration can be uh, uh, can 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 just uh, there, there there are some uh, with the increasing of the computational resources and its performance and the accelerating is not a good solution to this problem. So uh, this th these are two questions I want to ask you. Maybe maybe a bit long. Sorry, sorry okay, for the yeah. time. Yeah. Okay, th th those are good <laughs> questions, definitely. And let me just make sure for G G GW, you you can view me as a, a person familiar with these uh, tools because that's the starting point of my own research in this direction. Uh, so how many atoms do you typically uh, uh, simulate? Uh, you mean for, for in GW. the GW calculation. Uh, you mean now? Yeah, now. right now. Okay, okay. I think maybe, uh, for example, if you do uh, other systems, I think 20 atoms or 20 mm -hmm. atoms or second. Okay, okay. Yeah, let me just try to answer these two questions. The first one, um, yeah, that actually, uh, that's why actually in the beginning I, I, I found this problem hard to address. Then actually I, 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 I choose bottom up and top down perspectives and also static and dynamical ones. And I have to answer your question in a way that is more dynamical, because it's really an issue that is changing. And actually, in the very, very beginning, so you, you mentioned that how, when we fit this through energy. Yes, related, quite related to, to the second question is, uh, it give us chances to accelerate the calculations. And I would add more to scale up. And that's one more, even more important uh, factor, but let's say, if you have this potential uh, properly generated, then you have these kind of advantages. And that's, that's the story, uh, the beginning of the story, right? But how you generate it? How you generate it, it requires many, 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 many considerations, and it's really a dynamical issue. I, I still remember the first time I saw Tunchi's name in the application paper using deep potential. I, what I look at is not, uh, Actually, I didn't even look at the main text. I look at sub supplementary. Uh, at, at that time, I, I, I just saw, I just want to consider uh, how they generate data. If I remember cor correctly, uh, it's close to a millions of DFE calculations to add a lot of uh, some, uh, it's not accurately somewhere, and then it, uh, you, you add some <laughs> new uh, snapshots manually. Uh, why I, I look at that? Because at that time, I. I was about to sell the DP generator. It's more a bit more automatic, and it tries to uh, to, to 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 avoid the situation that you 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 add your property target property into the training set. So the 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 the, the it's really a, a competition of uh, like two kinds of uh, considerations: special purpose and general uh, general purpose. But we are just going back and forth and. A DP generator at that time gave us the opportunity to make this process automatic, but still we need some special step to make the potential more accurate for certain. But it's already better than the early step than the first work, right? And uh, I would not mention the whole process, but what I would want to say is right now, 
if you start your feeding process and whatever uh, model generation process from a pre-trained model, then you can assume that the pre-trained model has learned already a lot. And then the data needed and the special consideration needed will be even uh, very much even reduced. And uh, <clears throat> that's the process and that makes things easier and easier. If you want to see uh, similar examples, let's just talk about maybe CV and NLP. It's uh, all these uh, areas went through a, a similar process. And finally, uh, it's, it's just a model, new model system. And it, it's really a question that requires a dynamical point of view. Then the second one. So yeah, I, this is also something I, uh, in the very beginning, uh, fund, at the fundamental level, what, what, what's the acceleration will bring us, particularly for, uh, for, 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 for um, scientific discoveries and for scientific research. Yes, acceleration is secondary, I would say, but scale is first. So if, uh, so, so, so if you, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, from condensed matter, we have more is different, right? So all these things require scale. The large language model, it, it, it doesn't work if you only have one million parameters, but if you have like one billion, then things are different. Scale matters. Then <clears throat> how we increase scale. So if you look at all these, DFT and higher level electronic structure method, the scaling is poor, really poor. It's n to the right fourth order, fifth order, or at least n to the cube. Actually, even if you have a linear scaling machine, you're going from 10 GPUs to 10 million, then actually it's a linear scaling thing. But the methodology itself is like cubic scaling. So then that's computational complexity. The complexity stuff is not scalable, right? So we, we, we want our acceleration not only for certain small scale calculation, uh, calculation, but also suitable for large scale ones. That requires some thought, deeper thoughts on things like locality and whatever. But even with, like, if you look at the, even the icing model, it's very, pure and clear and very nearest neighbor interaction, right? Still at a larger scale for phase transitions for emerging, uh, this emerging phenomenon is very rich. And if you look at spin glass, it's even more rich, but it's just a small scale. It's very, you don't even need uh, acceleration, but yeah, scales are important. And then for defects and for, uh, for, 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 for all this uh, massive scale phenomenon for, for, for the, those domain interactions, even though the rule is uh, straightforward. You cannot apply GW to some <laughs> default calculation, right? Uh, yeah, and if I remember correctly, in the final competition of the 2020, 2020 Gordon Bell Prize, actually, I was just behind a uh, talk. I, I gave the talk for deep potential, and the, the one previous one is a report from Berkeley uh, for GW calculations, and using many, many ways the achievement is to increase the number of atoms, silicon, pure silicon system, right, from, if I remember correctly, around 1,000 to 2,000. And then the last challenging question is, what's the point of increase, uh, increasing this from 1,000 to 2,000? Yeah, and uh, even uh, there are questions to us, what's the point of simulating like 100 million, and I, we could say, oh, that's a, just a demo. We have a bunch of applications, but uh, we want to show the scale, right? Uh, so so the more, more is different. So I, I would say scaling up things will just give us new phenomena. And actually, particularly for those scale from microscopic to mesoscopic, I would say the theory de development and also all this research uh, requires new solutions. And uh, on top of scale efficiency, is another problem. Uh, I will not go into the, uh, go deeper into that, but there are still efficiency is also scaling up the computing computing system, and that also is challenging. I just I just want to add one point here, is that you know with computing you can always just wait a little longer and you'll have a faster computer, a bigger computer, but somebody who's developed some approximation method and managed to do and now already has solved the problem by the time the computer got bigger. <laughs> so you'll always miss if you're not doing, you know, this sort of state of the art at the time. And so, you know, I, I agree with him saying that, you know, sometimes scale 
does give you something which is emergent. But at the same time, you know, we still have to do the best we can, I think. And so approximations always have their role. And a lot of those things all fall by this wayside. I mean, many of the things I learned when I was a student, I would never teach them ever again. You know, people had all these graphical methods for solving equations yeah. and for nonlinear equations. So many nobody does yeah. that anymore. But they really you did a lot of science with it. Yeah. One last interesting thing is actually uh, because uh, another of my uh, co-advisor is Roberto Carr, and after this uh, techniques and the essential, I, I would say the theme of our uh, research is. I would say finite size effect. Finite size effect for a bunch of properties going from like LOTO splitting of the phonon to dielectric calculations, that di dielectric properties to a lot of other phase transition, right? All these things uh, now are possible. A finite size effect is a boundary between simulation and <laughs> real things, right? <laughs> okay, maybe we should end it here and let's thank Lin Feng again. Have a nice talk. Thanks.